7.30. We're going to kick off quick, quick smart because we've got a lot to get through tonight. Um, we've given ourselves an hour, but with a really meaty topic. Um, my name's Paula Brody. I'm here from the team of Voices of Benelong and Michelle Rawson and myself will be um, your hosts for the evening. I'd like to begin with acknowledging that the area in which we live in the Benelong electorate is on the lands of the Wallamadigal people of the Darug Nation, the traditional owners of this land. Voices of Benelong acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who now reside within the area and pay our respects to their ancestors and elders past, present and emerging. We respect their heritage and acknowledge and uphold their intrinsic connection and continuing relationships to country. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders belong to the oldest continuous living culture in the world and their sovereignty over their lands was never ceded. Now, before we start talking about climate, please note that we are recording the um, event tonight. Uh, we will post it on YouTube where you can find some of our previous events that we've um, also hosted. Please ensure your microphone is muted and um, as you would like put your video on or off given that we are recording. If you have submitted a question by email, we've incorporated what we can into our session. However, you also have an opportunity to write the questions as we go along in the chat um, function. And Robin will be monitoring our chat tonight. She has um, all over that. You'll find she will post links and other information as we go through um, for your um, handy access. Um, so welcome to everybody. I think we've got nearly everybody in, which is fantastic. I um, hope you enjoy the evening and I am going to hand over to Michelle to get started. Thank you. Thanks. So my name is Michelle Rawson and I'm president of Voices of Benelong, a group of volunteers that aim to increase political engagement in our electorate and advocate for stronger community representation from our elected representatives in federal parliament. So if you're frustrated by the current political situation, if you live in ben the Benelong electorate and want to be part of a movement that aims to return politics back to the people and away from vested interest groups, please visit our website, um, www.voicesofbenelong.org or email us at voicesofbenelong at gmail.com. Um, Robin will post those links in the chat. So Voices of Benelong have been listening to the community through our listening surveys, events and kitchen table conversations. There are two main areas that our research has shown that voters of Benelong feel that they're not being represented on. They are climate change and a return of integrity to politics. We've recently run an event on integrity with Craig Rucastle and Anthony Wheelie QC which has been posted to our YouTube channel. And Robin will post a link to that now if anybody's interested in seeing that. But tonight, our focus is on the other issue that the people of Benelong have shown is important to them and they want stronger action and better representation on. This is, of course, climate change. Um, we have three impressive guests lined up for you tonight. Is um, I'd like to welcome our first panel guest who would be Zali Stegel. Is Zali, is Zali on yet? Do we know? Zali's um, currently down in Canberra in Parliament. So she's just had a change of schedule. So hopefully she won't be too far away. No, I don't um, think she's joined yet. Okay. So um, I'll just introduce her anyway and go through the other guests. So Zali is the community-backed independent federal member for Wurringar. Through her work on the crossbench, not only holding our politics to account, but voting for her constituents and with her conscience every single time. Um, on every issue, Zali has proved an inspirational role model for other electorates to follow. She really has raised the bar. She has ensured that climate change has remained on Australia's political agenda, agenda, garnering widespread support for her Climate Act bill and her Stop PEP 11 bill as well. Um, her success in Warringah has in no small part inspired voices of groups from around Australia to achieve better political representation 
and challenge the status quo with community back to into independence. So welcome to Zali um, when she arrives. Next, I'd like to welcome Professor Leslie Hughes. Leslie is here. Um, Professor Leslie Hughes is not only a Benelong resident, but is a climate scientist and lead author on the fourth and fifth IPCC assessment reports. She's also a distinguished professor of biology, a pro vice chancellor of Macquarie University and an author at the Climate Council. Council. She's um, very much a world renowned expert on climate and we're very fortunate to have her here tonight. Welcome, Leslie. Um, and our next guest, our final guest for this evening will be Nicolette Buller. Nicolette is an executive manager who has specialised in responsible investment and sustainability for the past 10 years. Most recently, she was on the executive team of the Responsible Investment Association Australasia and the Investment Group on Climate Change. In 2012, Nicolette helped set up the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and she currently advises the Good Car Company to bring affordable electric vehicles to the Australian marketplace. Nicolette is also one of the amazing women standing up to run as a community-backed independent in the Bradfield electorate. Welcome, Nicolette. That's quite an impressive resume. Thanks, Michelle. So um, is, do we have Sally on yet? We were going to start with her, but we may actually start with you, Leslie. Um, I'll just quickly check. Pally, you don't have an email, do you? I just... No, I've checked. I'll keep an eye on it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Okay, so Leslie, so here we go. Um, Australia has been stuck in climate grid block for more than a decade. We have recently taken small steps forward with our government setting an official target of zero emissions by 2050. Is this enough? And what will our future look like if we follow this trajectory? Well, the short answer is no, it's absolutely not enough. It's at least a decade too late. Um, I think everybody will remember that the net zero target for 2050 was only agreed to by the government about two or three days before the last climate big climate meeting in Glasgow. So it was something that the government clearly didn't want to do, but was pressured at the last minute to do. If we wait till 2050 to um, get to net zero emissions, we will be in an almost uninhabitable world. So the world has already warmed about 1.2 degrees. Uh, the pledges to the Glasgow COP will still get us to 2.4 degrees, so twice as much warming as we've had already. Australia is one of the most vulnerable countries to extreme events from climate change. You know, imagine if we simply just doubled all the extreme events that we've had over the last decade. Um, going ahead. So net zero by 2050 is a decade too late. We've got a report out from the Climate Council that indicates that for Australia to do its bit, we need to be net zero by 2035. So it's a much more ambitious target. And net, to, even talking about 2050 is just kicking the can down the road. It's actually what we do this decade, what we do by 2030, that really counts. So and unfortunately, the government has refused to increase its very unambitious target for 2030. And we now have a target that is almost the weakest in the world. Wow, it's quite astounding. You know, those, those words that if we wait for 2050, we'll have an uninhabitable world and that that's the trajectory our government currently has us on. Um, so if, if all countries in the world had the same level of ambition as Australia, we would reach four degrees by the end of this century. And that, that is actually unimaginable, I think, for most of us. Yeah, that's kind of extinction. Is it, is it yeah, extinction? Well, it's certainly extinction of a lot of things. Um, maybe the human race too, who, who knows? Yeah. Wouldn't yeah. be good. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the science of climate change is very complicated. How can we be confident in the, those predictions? Well, firstly, we've understood the basic physics of climate change for nearly 200 years. So it's, it's not new science as such. 
But when we come up with climate models, what we can do is test them against real observations. So we can say, all right, well, if we'd had this model back 20 years ago, would we have been able to predict the temperature that we've just had for the last two decades? And the models and the observations actually, for temperature at least, um, are, are very close. So, so we can now really predict temperature change um, pretty accurately, like not for, not for a particular you know, square kilometre of land, but certainly a region and certainly a continent. So we're very confident about temperature projections. It's harder to predict rainfall and other events that um, are affected by things like distance from the coast and topography and that sort of thing. But for temperature, um, the models are you know, really very good. Uh, if anything, they may be a little bit conservative. The world has actually been warming a bit faster than a lot of the models have predicted. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with an election looming, our government has recently announced $1 billion in funding to save the Great Barrier Reef. Is this enough? And does the funding target the root cause of the problem? No, well, a billion dollars isn't going to save the Great Barrier Reef, that's for sure. Even the government does recognise on the one hand that climate change is the greatest threat to the Great Barrier Reef. None of that $1 billion worth of funding is um, aimed at helping that problem. So while um, funding for environmental causes and things like improving water quality uh, and reducing crown of thorns starfish, they're not unwelcome. We need that funding as well, but without actually addressing the root cause of the reef's major problem, which is underwater heat waves caused by climate change, uh, you know, you might as well take a billion dollars and, and row it out into the reef and throw it in the water because with, without actually addressing climate change, all of those other threats, um, even if we were to be able to fix them, are not going to save the reef in the long run. Yeah, and I think, I think we're seeing something similar with koala funding and, you know, Well, it, it is analogous, you know, unless it's all very well to say, well, we're going to offset cleared land uh, but if you keep doing that you basically lose all koala habitats so yeah 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 okay so our government is back to a gas-led covid recovery can natural gas be clean gas can it ever be clean well, gas is a fossil fuel gas is a fossil fuel when it's burnt it releases co2 into the atmosphere and um, when it's mined, it often releases uh, methane into the atmosphere. And methane, of course, is um, a much more effective greenhouse gas even than CO2, you know, 80 times more effective um, over 20 years. So gas is not the answer. Um, gas is contributing to the problem that we have. And we've got to actually stop mining and using gas just as we have to stop mining and using coal. Yep. Okay, um, so is it possible our government um, will have us believe that we can continue to profit from fossil fuels and um, technology, not taxes, will save us? Is that actually possible? Can we continue to open up new fossil fuel, fuel projects such as gas and reduce our emissions at the same time? Well, if we just look at the, if we say that the proof's in the pudding, there's been billions and billions of dollars invested in so-called carbon capture and storage over the last decade or two, including in Australia, billions and billions of dollars. And we haven't actually achieved carbon capture and storage at anything like the scale and effectiveness that we would need to stop CO2 going into the atmosphere. So given that it hasn't worked despite the investment in it, and given that renewables from new renewable infrastructure, solar and wind, now produces electricity at a far lower rate than um, any um, new fossil fuel infrastructure, it doesn't actually make any economic sense either. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if we have any questions from the audience. I can see some on my chat there, but I can't see any questions. Are there any, um, Robin, any questions? Yes, we've got one question. There's a question, uh, actually, maybe there's two questions now. There's a question from, uh, I apologize, uh, Wiz. 
if I've got your name correct. The, the federal parliament is important to set regulations and funding. However, can the states, territories, business industry, individuals and communities do sufficiently to limit climate change impacts? I think it's a, a well, question. Well, it's a good question. And, in, and indeed that is possible. I mean, if you imagine the situation where every state and territory was net zero, then it wouldn't matter what the federal government did because we'd be net zero. Um, and indeed, many of the states and territories, many local governments, many businesses, many uh, communities are actually doing a fantastic job at limiting emissions. But the point is that without strong policy action from the federal government, all of that is much, much slower and much less effective than it needs to be. So we need action at all levels. We need good, strong policy at the federal government level, as well as the other levels of government, and as well as investment in business. And when there is a vacuum of leadership at the top, it means that the, the gains that we are making are despite the federal government, not because of it. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, another question, what is the government planning to spend its funding on for the uh, Great Barrier Reef and koalas, if not on the mitigation of climate change? What is the government proposing other to, uh, what is the government proposing to use the dollars for? Well, my understanding is that about half of the money for the reef is going to um, in programs to improve water quality. The idea being if you make the reef resilient, you can make the reef more resilient to the impacts of climate change if you fix all the other threats. And that, that is true up to a point. Um, so improving water quality is good. About, um, about 500 million or so, I understand, is going towards that. Um, but the, the money is spread out over nine years and the government hasn't said how much they would spend in the first year or second year versus the, the nine years. Um, other money is going towards research. Some of it's going towards controlling crown of thorns starfish. All of those things are important. But as I said before, unless we fix the root cause of the main threat, um, all of that money is really just like putting a Band-Aid on a broken leg. In terms of koalas, well, as you would know, koalas have just been listed as endangered. They've been raised in endangered status from vulnerable to endangered, which is really just a recognition that they're really in trouble, um, which, is, which is a good step. Um, but unless the government is serious about preventing more land clearing of um, habitat for things like urban sprawl, um, well, then just listing isn't going to save a single koala. And of course, as climate change continues to bite, we lost tens of thousands of koalas in the black summer bushfires, which were fueled by climate change. So um, these things actually are all connected. Yeah, thank you. And there's another question, uh, which is a contrast. So what are your thoughts on Labor's climate plan? Mm -hmm. Well, look, it's better than the coalition plan, but it's not strong enough. So Labor um, is looking for some reason, I don't know why they picked 43%. It seems like kind of an odd number. Uh, they say it's backed by some sort of modeling. Um, they've said that they want to reduce emissions by 2030 by 43% compared to 2005 levels. It of course is better than the coalition target of 26 to 28%. But on the Climate Council, we've used a technique called the carbon budget and some modelling to indicate that really for Australia to do its fair share, we need to um, reduce our emissions 75% by 2030. Um, and given that we have such amazing renewable resources, that is doable with the right policy settings. So Labor, I would say a bit better than the coalition, but not good enough. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question here, which is possibly following on from what you just said. Is limiting warming to 1.5 degrees still possible? Uh, what bet zero goal, uh, what bet zero goal That's should Australia zero have goal. to achieve? Yeah. <laughs> oh, net zero goal should Australia have to achieve this goal? Or it's yeah, look, it's, it's a really good question. Um, the problem with climate change, if you think about climate change as being like a really, really big ocean liner, when you put the brakes on, it takes a long time to turn the ship around. So the climate that we're experiencing now is due to emissions 
that have been put into the atmosphere over the last 20 or 30 years. So what we're doing now affects, affects climate in you know, 2040, 2050. So even if we were to stop emissions today completely by some miracle, um, there's about somewhere between a 0.2 and 0.6 of a degree of warming locked in. And that basically takes us, Australia's already warmed 1.44 degrees or probably a bit more. So that actually takes us um, over 1.5. So from a scientific perspective, it is extremely unlikely that we will remain below 1.5. We've got to work very hard to stay underneath two. Um, and if we do overshoot 1.5, which is likely to happen in the early 2030s, if not before, we've got to work hard to then bring, back, bring it back down again. So what this emphasises, if you think about emissions like a mountain, but the mountain is growing all the time. And what we need to do is get to the top of the mountain and start coming down the other side. And the longer we delay to get to the top and peak emissions, the higher the mountain peak actually is and the harder it is to get there. So, you know, that's what we've got to do between now and 2030 to really not overshoot that 1.5 by too much. Uh, because that makes the challenge next decade easier. But the chances of staying below 1.5, unfortunately, are very slim indeed. Thank you, Leslie. I think the next question there looks more like a question for Nicolette. So, um, uh, yeah. Michelle? Yeah, I think, I think Sally is still a little bit delayed, so she'll be coming um, probably in about five minutes. So we might start with you, Nicolette, and just move on from there. Thank you, Leslie. It's always sobering to hear you speak, but I think it's really important that we do hear you speak. You know, we, we may not, you know, maybe hard to hear the message, but my goodness, <laughs> we all need to. Um, so thank you. So Nicolette, we're now going to look at some of the economic impacts of Australia's current climate trajectory. Um, Australia has a global reputation for being a climate laggard, consistently ranked last in developed nations on measures such as policies to reduce emissions and on our reliance on fossil fuels, both, both as an export earner and for our own domestic use. In your experience, how is our lag of reputation impacting on other countries' willingness to invest in Australia? My news is not much chirpier than Leslie's, I'm afraid. <laughs> but yes, we, Australia is a laggard, and we've been a laggard really since we signed the Kyoto Protocol back in 1997. Just for context, that's 25 years ago, if you've got a little bit of problem with math over the change of the century there. Um, and just want to take a moment to point out that when we're talking about the phasing out of the reliance on fossil fuels, this is really about getting out of fossil fuels for heat and power. We're still going to need some fossil fuels for oils and some plastics like polymers, which we use in medical devices or natural gas for transporting chemicals, but nothing like the volume that Australia is pulling out of the ground every year. Uh, most of our coal that we pull out of the ground, around 90% of it, is exported. So we're using around 10% for domestic use. And that's really important because there's now over 75% of all of our bilateral exports. So countries that directly buy Australian coal uh, have near-term emission reduction targets for 2030 and 2035. So there's like Japan and South Korea, um, Indonesia, the Philippines and China. So these, when we have a, a national target like we do, which kicks in in 28 years from now, rather than in eight years from now, it puts us squarely in that laggard camp. And there's just no sugarcoating it. Um, Australia's staying outside that camp to committing to a 2030 emission reduction target is of absolute deep concern for investors. Um, trading partners like the EU, putting tariffs on imports that have been produced without that, um, that certificate to show that it's been produced to mitigate climate impacts and. Of course, they're going to do that because they don't want to um, unduly flood their market with cheaper, dirtier imports. But this has impacts nationally on our economy and locally for the coal and gas communities. And as the demand for the fossil fuel exports naturally slows, um, that's going to have a really large effect um, throughout the mining and resources value chains. And ultimately, I have concerns about the impacts it's going to have on small business and workers, and particularly the communities in which they live. Um, Places like the Hunter Valley, the Bowen Basin, 
um, and the Galilee Basin, they, they really need to start a strategic pivot away from that heavy reliance on fossil fuels and to start to diversify their economic base. And what the good news is we've seen, particularly in Hunter, some um, investment from the New South Wales government to start supporting um, some thinking around that. And there's organisations like the Hunter Jobs Alliance that are popping up. But um, Michelle, to your question about this label of laggard, impacting investments. Um, yeah, it is. Um, I'm on the Climate Venture Capital Fund based in Aotearoa, and the Venture Capital Fund seeks to invest in um, early stage climate solutions in New Zealand, in Australia and in the region. And whilst it's just getting started, the early indications are to invest in New Zealand is a hell of a lot easier than to invest in Australia. Like New Zealand has um, Sorry, Leslie, it does have a climate change commission <laughs> that the government listens to. Um, it, it reviewed the government's policies. It has five-year rolling carbon budgets that must be considered and the policymakers have to disclose the extent to which they're going to consider in policy the recommendations of the commission. And um, I just want to note that Zali has built that into her climate change mitigation adaptation bill. Um, and when elected, I'll be supporting that, of course. Um, and New Zealand's one of those few countries that has net zero emissions by 2050 goal enshrined in law in their Zero Carbon Act. And that gives investors a lot more certainty about where they're going and at what pace. Um, they've got an emissions trading scheme that's recently been renovated. They've got a whole lot of institutions like green banks that help de-risk and do co-investment with emerging technologies. We've got some of those too, like ARENA and the Clean Energy Finance Corporation here in Australia. Um, and of course, New Zealand's not perfect. Um, there's a whole lot of areas of their economy that doesn't come under net zero, but at least they've got something and they've started and they've started with in earnest. We've got taxpayer funded grants programs that fund the big end of town cleaning up the business when we could be doing it a lot more efficiently with a price of carbon. And so um, probably on to end on that, the um, investor group on climate change at the end of last, uh, last year did some research and found that there is $131 billion in clean industry investment and new jobs that could be unleashed if we took on a 2030 target aligned with Paris. Um, and 70% of their members that they surveyed at the same time, cited the lack of climate policy in Australia as the key barrier to investment. So it having clear signals unlocks capital and makes it flow. And there's just very little downside, if any, to doing this. So what would be the um, long-term impact on our economy? Well, we're just not gonna be economically um, viable. We don't have the diversity of economic base. We're gonna be impacted in terms of our ability our international competitiveness. Um, our people just don't want to take our, our, our exports in terms of coal and, and natural gas because there's no market for them over there. Uh, the bottom line is it goes right down to jobs. Jobs for our kids, jobs in what? Um, and that's probably a great segue into EVs. We, we just don't have a manufacturing base to start retooling for the types of opportunities that we could be creating if we really in earnest Put ourselves on the path to have a plan for climate action that should be the job of the government have that leadership but it hasn't it's been the heavy lifting has been done by households through buying solar panels on their rooftops and some evs that are still quite expensive and the other heavy lifting has been done by the business and investment sector to date yeah okay um thanks nicolette um robin do you have any questions in the chat. Yes, we've actually got five questions here. There are uh, quite a range of questions. If we scroll just up a little bit here, there are... So the first question was from Jordan. Uh, economists, business and scientists understand a price on carbon is the most effective foundational solution for reducing emissions. What would an effective price on carbon mean to you and how would it help? Yes, I've also heard from that figure that a very, very large majority of economists point to a price on carbon as the most efficient way to have price discovery. Of course, um, probably one of the most effective mechanisms is a cap and trade system. And I always think about musical chairs. You know, they have, they, we know that in the end, we're going to have one winner or two chairs, maybe one chair. 
And we, over time, when the music stops, we're going to pull one out. And that's what a cap and trade system does. And the role of government in that is to say, we know we have to reduce our emissions down to net zero by 2050. So let's put a path in place that reduces that cap over time. The market will find um, the best the best ways to deliver uh, low carbon technologies within those constraints. And then there's a whole lot of other bits and pieces you can throw in there around import exports and, and flaws and what have you. But hands down, um, I'm a big fan of the cap and trade system and uh, uh, pricing carbon through an emissions trading scheme. And I think Nicolette, you might have just answered the next question, which was from Samantha. I'll just tell you what the question was and you can tell me I, I'm right. What are the best market mechanisms she's come across in her profession that will get considerable funds in the private sector moving in the right direction? Did you want to add anything? No, that's, that's pretty much it. When investors, I mean, they've been doing their best to look at pricing signals overseas and trying to shadow price that into um, their own pricing models here. But because of the uncertainty, you're always going to get miss priced risk and if we just had some better price discovery investors could do their job a lot quicker and cheaper and that flows on to people like you and me buying goods and services because they bring those products to market at a, at a cheaper rate rather than with all these unknown costs and things that they may have to build in so it's just good government policy gives some certainty to business which helps investors make the money flow better yeah. But the next question is, is it correct that Australia is the second largest exporter of coal in the world? Do you have any suggestions on how we could transition away from this industry and what would be important to reduce worldwide emissions? And sorry, Rob, what would be useful? Uh, what, and, and would it be important to reduce worldwide emissions? Ah, okay. Um, well, there are a few other more esteemed and knowledgeable people on this call than I am in terms of knowing all about coal exports. I actually it thought might have been a question for Leslie that one actually. It's a little oh, is it? Yeah, it could have been. So if, if we could, we can always flick it to Leslie. Do you want to take it, Leslie? Look, let me start and, and then Nicolette, you, you chip in. Yes, Australia is the second largest exporter of coal. So you think about, you know, we often get politicians saying, oh, um, what can Australia do? We're only responsible for 1.3% of emissions. Now, that's what we burn at home. Of course, climate change and emissions don't respect country boundaries. It doesn't matter if it's burnt here or somewhere else. If we are supplying the coal to be burnt somewhere else, we are a huge contributor to climate change. So we've got to stop We've got to stop letting politicians get away with this 1.3% argument, you know, I don't hold a hose mate type of argument, um, and actually look at our contribution to the world's problems. And we are an enormous contributor to those problems. Um, do you have any suggestions on how we could transition away from this industry? Well, look, I think there's an enormous amount of interest going into transitioning coal dependent communities to other things. And as lots of people have been pointing out, um, in a lot of these coal dependent communities like the Bowen Basin, like um, the La Trobe Valley, like the Hunter River, there's a lot of skilled people that could bring those skills to bear doing other things like producing energy from renewables you know those you know places like the hunter had an enormous steel industry you know we still need to produce steel uh, produce manufacturing so it's a matter of um, actually moving sooner rather than later just as many other countries like germany are doing they're transitioning their communities before they absolutely have to rather than keeping on just ripping the resources out of the ground until the price collapses and then those communities collapse. So, so morally, we have an obligation as a country and as a society to support those communities to do something else. But the sooner we do that, the better. Thank you, Leslie, I agree. So we've got a lovely comment here from Catherine, which is just a I think a, a really good support for the, the work that's being done in, in saving koalas. And also a comment to you, Leslie, again from Luis. Uh, Roz has put up a couple of questions. I'm not quite sure who the best person is to answer this, but I'll, I'll put the question out there. The argument we get is that Australia contributes relatively small amounts to climate change. If we did take more action, 
would we get a multiplying factor by influencing other countries, other nations? I think Nicolette addressed that. So Nicolette, do you want to take well, that again? I was going to say, Leslie, that's, in, that's, your, that's your remit, that's your lane. Be my guest. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it would. I mean, it, and it does go to also what Nicolette said about investment. I mean, because Australia is seen as a lagger that is affecting our investment, you know, Australia should be leading by example. You know, we are one of the, the wealthiest and most educated and most technologically advanced countries in the world. Uh, we should be leaders in lots of things, but we absolutely should be leaders in climate change. Um, you know, we are, uh, as um, I think Nicolette said before, a pariah on, on the world stage in, in terms of climate. You know, if it was, a, it, we'd be a laughing stock if it was less serious, but um, absolutely we, we can't um, keep being the laggard in the position that we're in and expect to get international respect. So I'll move on to the next question. I'm actually going to hold Peter's question because I, I think that's um, regarding Zali's Climate Act. I think it's a great question that it deserves its um, own space. There's another question here from Emma Gilberg. In your opinion, if sustainable climate action possible given our current economic structure, which relies on continual growth on the back of finite so resources, i.e. does our economy need restructuring, a circular economy, etc.? Uh, is that Nicolette's? Yeah, I'll take that. Um, hell yes, I think is the answer. Don't know if that's very technical for you, but I like it. <laughs> absolutely. I'm a big fan of Kate Warworth's uh, Donut Economics, which has a, and inside the donut, which is the base of the sort of minimum viable product for, for humans as, as, and people to live in dignity. And on the outside of the donut recognizes the planetary boundaries of our natural systems. And it invites us to have an economy with a consideration of the minimum opportunities for human dignity within the physical constraints of our natural world. And so I, you know, maybe, maybe in my second term, we can look at redefining growth and getting rid of gross domestic product as the, the sole indicator for growth and, and whether growth is in fact a good thing. I'd rather say I'm a big fan of terms like sufficient prosperity rather than profit at all costs. Um, and it kind of goes to why I've been focusing my last 10 years of my career around putting purpose into finance. And, and uh, you know, I'm thrilled to have worked with some really amazing thinkers in investment and business that really understand that making profit just for profit's sake is a bit boring, um, <laughs> if you like, but putting money to, to work for like all of those sort of 17 sustainable development goals, things like um, cracking the housing affordability or community women's shelters, all sorts of things that actually improve people's lifestyles and, and their ability to live to old age with dignity or even restore and preserve our landscapes and habitat for wildlife. Those types of things get investors really excited and it makes investment meaningful. So I think that purpose in finance and business is the types of models that are going to finish it as donut. And it's not just about growth for growth's sake. It's about improving the quality of, um, of our experience on the planet. A little bit off topic there. Very passionate thing for me. <laughs> it's, it's oh, I love passion. <laughs> Michelle, would you like to put some of the questions up? I, or will I keep going? Um, how are we going for time? I'm just, I'm just waiting to... Uh, Zali's logging on now, so maybe a couple more questions. Okay, so, so Nick, while you're on a roll, but we've got a question here from Jane. Uh, what do you say to the alarmists who claim we are running out of oil? Oh, um, breathe. Um, I don't know about you, but I've just filled up my ICE, my internal combustion engine, um, with over $100 worth of fuel today. I oh, know yesterday at $1.97. I am very much looking forward <laughs> to transitioning my domestic fleet across to electric vehicles and maybe maybe it's gonna cost six or seven dollars. Um, so um, I think it's time. I just get really excited about the idea of um, improving our national security when we wean off oil, um, giving householders the ability to have just lower operating and running costs from their vehicles. That I just don't see any immediate downside, apart from the fact that we might be ignoring some of our communities that need to transition away from fossil fuels, that needs to be addressed. But the idea of 
pulling oil out of our energy system is an, only an upside for me on every way. And it's obviously much, much cleaner for our climate as well. Yeah, excellent. Okay, thank you, Nicolette. That's, that's wonderful. Um, so Zali Stegel, I think, has logged on. Are you there, Zali? I am. Hi, sorry about the delay. <laughs> that's okay, thank you. Um, do you need a few minutes or are you? Yeah, no, I'm all good. I've been listening to the last. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, if I could start by paying my respect um, to traditional owners um, of the land where I'm um, coming to you from, but also for all of you and where you are, may we uh, learn to tread a little more lightly on this earth and actually work together. And I do acknowledge it wasn't never seeded. Um, you want to talk about climate? Sorry, my head's been in a lot of other spaces today, so I'm Sorry if I'm not going to be as clear as I should be. Um, but look, the joys um, of uh, being in Parliament. Um, but look, incredibly important in terms of talking about climate, about where we are at the end of this Parliament. We're in the dying days, only a couple of sitting days left. Um, and we really don't have, I think, a satisfactory position um, in terms of our commitments and where we're up to. Um, so... I think through pressure of a number of independents and um, communities and experts like um, Leslie and many others, we have pushed the government to acknowledge net zero, to commit to that. But I don't think it's a fair dinkum commitment. I think it really is a uh, tick the box that was done pre uh, COP26 this year because ultimately there isn't the kind of plans and actual policies to deliver it. So for me, to, I think uh, forward planning is incredibly important for addressing climate. Um, and that's why I introduced the climate change bills to parliament uh, last year and then conducted the inquiry, which many of you actually have um, probably contributed to. Uh, we had a record number of uh, contributions to the inquiry and overwhelmingly civic society, business, unions, um, industry all supported legislating net zero by 2050 and having that clear framework um, because it would provide that certainty and stability, but it would also provide that pathway of, you know, the forward planning that's required when decisions that are over the long term are being made. Um, so the key elements of the bill, if I can just recap them, uh, being the sections of obviously we have clear pr guiding principles in the bill of what's trying to be achieved and how we should do that and generational equity, geographic equity, contribution to it is really important. Um, it sets that line in the sand of net zero by 2050, but that is a date that can be amended under recommendation by a climate change commission, obviously with a continual analysis of the science of the changes and the data. Um, and the case is stronger and stronger, obviously, for that to be brought forward. Um, it also, I have amended the bill to introduce that there is an, ob in the objects, that the, the interim target, um, which is really where we need to be by 2030, that the objects of policy should be to achieve 60% reductions by 2030. And so that is basically to drive that ambition from a planning point of view. The bill provides that we have five-year emission reduction budgets, and all of those need to set us on that journey to net zero. And by putting that interim object, it, it, it identifies upfront that we need to do the work early. We need to do the work in this next decade. Um, and we do know from the science that we have the technology to do that part of the work already now over the next 10 years. Um, the other elements that are really important in the bill are the parts that we don't, I think, spend enough time focusing on in Parliament, which is the risk assessment aspect. And the inquiry really exposed this. We still don't have proper national risk assessment of how we are exposed to climate risks. So whether that is 
from a national security point of view, whether that is from droughts and flooding or extreme weather events, but also coastal erosion. Are we building buildings that are future proof? How are we doing our infrastructure planning? Issues like that are really important. Um, in, under questioning, the department actually acknowledged that they are not modelling impact to industries. And so, for example, fisheries and um, or tourism, they are not modelling the impact of our current trajectory, which is plus three degrees. So um, that's pretty frightening from a risk assessment point of view of what you know we are on track for. Um, coupled in the bill with risk assessment is the adaptation plan. Once you know your risks, then you clearly have to acknowledge mitigation, which is reducing emissions, and um, adaptation, which is where we can't mitigate, what do we need to ensure we do? And so that's things like building codes for construction, environmental protections, you know, what else should we be doing? Do we need to strengthen our bushfire response capability? Clearly, yes, from the Royal Commission investigating our response to bushfires. Um, and so there's a lot of work that needs to be done that's just not being done at the moment. So the bills themselves were broadly supported because of all these elements. They set that clear framework. They give investment certainty. Um, obviously, politics, um, it became a partisan line. And during the inquiry, um, uh, coalition uh, objected and voted against. Labor indicated support. They have a process by which they have to, um, uh, the caucus has to consider a bill. So they gave in principle support and support debating the bill. Um, but of course, they are being a little coy in terms of their own um, emission reduction um, ambition uh, in relation to the next election. Um, so where the bill is at at the moment, it is still on the notice paper. I have uh, late last year tried to move a suspension of standing orders to bring it on for debate around COP26. Um, the government still excuse me, government still holds a majority of one in the House of Reps. But I'm also, unfortunately, the strategy around the bill has also been impacted by COVID restrictions has meant that we don't have a full parliament sitting. We have on average had from half to two thirds of parliament sitting, um, which means Procedural votes, which are suspension of standing orders, require an absolute majority, which is 76, half of the 151, um, which is just practically impossible. It means you basically need, of the number of MPs sitting in the chamber, you need about 20 people to cross the floor. Now, anyone following Parliament last week would know it was a big deal when five or one or five crossed the floor on the religious discrimination bill. So... The goal of trying to get 20 to cross the floor is just near on impossible. And that is a technicality of the current rules, um, standing orders in the house around who is attending because of COVID and actual um, uh, standing orders. How do we suspend standing orders? Obviously, we are, we've only got a handful of sitting days in this parliament. So whilst the bill remains on the notice paper right up until the end, it is likely to be a, um, an election early May. We've got two more days. Then we come back in March for a budget on the Tuesday, a budget in reply by Labor on the Thursday. And I anticipate the election being called Friday or Monday. Maybe not Friday because that would be April 1st. <laughs> so people might think it's an April Fool's. But I think probably the following Monday there will be an election called, um, we think, probably for about 14th of May. Um, what happens is... Um, look, I have committed to re-contesting, uh, obviously, in Moringa, and I'm hoping, very much hoping, that I'm going to be joined by many other independents focused on putting solutions forward for climate. Um, uh, the, um, the bill, I will reintroduce the bill in the next, uh, if I am elected again, I would might absolutely commit and pledge to reintroducing the bill um, and uh, obviously, Obviously, you know, working more with whoever is in government and whoever is on the crossbench to get it uh, passed. Um, in terms of, uh, I think, climate, um, it's been vitally important, all the work all you have done, like organisations like you on the ground in communities talking about what we need to do more in a policy front has been so important to get 
to ensure the conversation, you know, doesn't stop. Uh, I was always very frustrated that we talk climate every three years at an election and not enough in between. And it's not enough accountability on government on the process and what happens in between. And I think that has dramatically changed in the last three years where I know for the fact, as a fact that the opposition didn't want to have to talk climate after losing the last election, didn't want to be wedged on this. Um, and they would not have talked climate but for us pushing it forward from the crossbench. So I think that's really important. Um, from your point of view to electorates, a lot of MPs say a lot on the campaign trail, but don't really vote to reflect what they say. Um, and that is the really biggest problem um, that you communities believe they are sending someone to Canberra to vote meaningfully on these issues, but when they are given the opportunity to, they don't. Um, and I think that's where the benefit of the crossbench, we have that ability to work with both sides of parliament, um, but also to put forward solutions. And a classic, um, you know, a really big example for that was last week with the sex discrimination bill, um, that amendments were able to be moved from the crossbench. They were able to get support from backbenchers that would not have crossed the floor for amendments from the opposition. Um, and so the, it's really important to understand that there is a big difference. Um, also, I mean, from an environmental point of view, I know people always ask, you know, how effective are independents? Um, I think incredibly effective in moving the national debate, in ensuring issues stay at the forefront and journalists are asking the questions in putting forward solutions and showing that we can build consensus, that it doesn't have to be as a binary choice and so divisive as I think the major political parties would have us all believe. Um, it is also, um, I, I think, really important to show that you can put amazing pressure on government, especially when it comes to around elections and having alternative choices. So if you look at stop, um, you know, the bill to stop PEP 11. So for those of you not aware, uh, there has been a long-standing license for drilling um, for exploration. It was seismic testing as well, but it was ultimately drilling for oil and gas off the coast, uh, the east coast of New South Wales from Newcastle to Manly, quite a vast um, ocean area, marine area. Um, it was, you know, it has been in place for a long time, but obviously it was, there was an application on foot to renew it and extend it to um, exploratory drilling. So a lot of people said a lot of things, you know, a lot of campaigning from community point of view. Um, but I, we, the New South Wales government rejected the proposal over a year ago. But the minister here, the federal government have, you know, declined to really make a position. So late last year, I introduced legislation to stop PEP 11 and I pushed a suspension of standing order to push for a vote. Now, that was really problematic for local members such as, you know, my, my, the MP of McKellar um, or MP of Wentworth, who have all stood on a platform of, protecting our beaches and environment, but ultimately never really vote in accordance to those um, kind of commitments. Um, and I, I strongly believe that the pressure of their voting record, so they, they, they declined to vote in favour of a suspension of standing orders to debate and vote on PEP 11. And that voting record to their community was an indication that when it comes down to it, they will not vote. They won't put community first. They will stick with the party line. And I think that's what you would have found of your own member <laughs> and his actions. Um, and so that's why it is incredibly important for communities to really engage with representative democracy, engage with the issues and the opportunities to participate, whether it's inquiries, whether, you know, petitions, inquiries, UMPs, and, and, and the drafting of legislation. Um, and I think that's where I strongly believe independence can break the climate deadlock in Parliament. I think the major parties are conflicted. Um, and whilst I think the opposition is more committed to action than the coalition, um, I don't think their commitment goes far enough because it will ultimately be um, dependent on their political fortunes. Um, and it's always 
you know, they do still put the ultimate win for, you know, goes ahead of policy. Uh, and, for example, um, I moved um, that we block any funding of fossil fuels through the, um, the foreign... Oh, I can't even think of the fund's name now, but our foreign sort of assistance credit um, or through the uh, Northern uh, Australia Industry Fund, the NAIF, um, for the fracking for gas for the Beetaloo Basin. Um, and both the Coalition and Labor voted in support, right? Labor declined to back opposing that. So um, I think you can't, you know, that's very inconsistent um, because we know, for example, that the Beetaloo Basin is a methane bomb waiting to happen in terms of our emissions. Um, so, yeah, I think we need to move forward. Um, if I would say in light of the events of this week and the criticism and everything that's been coming, it's an interesting debate that I think there is around, you know, the pointing the finger and it's been put to me that... Um, I should not have, for example, accepted support from people who have made their wealth from um, fossil fuels. I, uh, I don't agree. Uh, I, I absolutely believe we need everyone to see the error of their ways and move on to fighting for climate. And a big part of my campaign in 2019 was about and elect, my electorate has traditionally voted Liberal, has voted for the same member for 25 years. I think your electorate has had a little bit more shift, but not much more. Um, it is about giving people permission to move on without recrimination of being blamed for the past. Um, and uh, if people have, you know, some people moved on climate 20 years ago, some people 10 years ago, some five years ago, but the most important time we want people to move and put climate first is in the next three months when they vote at this election. And I think everything has to be done to make that possible. Um, and for me, that's, that's the most important thing. So I'm happy to take questions. I know there's, I can see the chat ticking away with a few questions. So I might have a quick look um, on where, uh, yes, where the questions are. But you, anyone might want to put them to me orally. I don't know how your process is working or how you go. So I can, I can help you with the questions, Sally. That was a fabulous answer you just made then. For someone who's uh, run in from, a, from a, a very full day, I am so impressed. So the first questions are actually from Peter Horsley. What specifically is needed to get your Climate Act passed through Parliament? Uh, well, look, um, Labor and the cross and Greens have in principle supported it. Um, they haven't put to me amendments they would indicate, but I'm sure there would be amendments. Um, so technically, from a chamber point of view, we need three more independents. Um, the coalition has a majority of one as it stands, uh, but they do benefit from the vote of Bob Catter and Craig Kelly. Um, and whilst, you know, I've worked hard on a lot of people, I'm not sure that I can quite get Craig Kelly and Bob Catter over the line. <laughs> so it, that being said, I, it means three independents are needed to change where the balance would be in a, from a voting sense. Um, in the Senate, there only needs to be one person to change. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not an insurmountable task. It absolutely can be done, especially when many, um, many politicians go to their electorate with promises on climate and we really don't have anything delivered. So I think it's, uh, you've probably had this conversation about where are we, what's been achieved in three years, and really not much. Any reduction of emissions has been thanks to the pandemic um, and reduction in travel and, and activity as a result. I don't really think you can claim a pandemic as good policy planning to address a major, major problem of the future. But where the conversation has shifted is that recognising the opportunities of the shift to a clean um, and net zero world, but also the shift that has happened around the world. So it's not perfect. There are still plenty of areas that need to be better. But there is a definite shift from our trading partners and major economies like the EU, like the UK, like the US, towards reducing emissions. And if Australia does not 
follow suit. We are going to be left, left behind from an investment point of view. We will face carbon border tariffs. Um, it, it will have consequences. Already we are seen as a more risky jurisdiction to invest in. So the state governments have recognised this. I've talked with someone like Matt Keane quite a bit when he was Environment Minister and Energy and now he's the Treasurer. He absolutely recognises those opportunities and the need for us to be sending much better signals to the rest of the world. Um, so, yeah, we um, it's really important. So I think the conversation has moved a lot, but the actions of the government haven't really, right? We have uh, Barnaby Joyce is really in control. It's clear from events before COP26 that our climate commitment as a nation is held up by the nationals. They are the negotiating partner in the coalition and they are holding up any action. Um, I haven't seen anything released by the government that indicates any intention, willingness or um, uh, to accelerate emissions reduction. I can only describe everything that's been done as a hand handbrake on all the good work that communities and organisations and state governments are doing. Um, to give you an idea, in our last budget, there was still a funding of about 80 to 1 to fossil fuels compared to renewables. So we have a long way to go. So I'm going to rejuggle the order. I'm going to give you the next questions because uh, Tim and Joe asked uh, sort of two questions similar. Uh, we need to look to the industries of the future as well, rather than being so worried about the inevitable impact of industries on the past uh, and dying a, a natural necessary death. Australia is now a world leader in lithium mining. Why do our politicians never talk about this world leadership and the investment, employment and export opportunities it brings? And Joe adds to this, uh, is there anything that will make the government change their tune in the event they are re-elected or will they just continue as business as usual? So it's all about... about Look, I strongly about. believe the coalition will continue with business as usual unless there is a forced reset. Um, I just haven't seen that intent to really change. I look at it from a point of view that someone like Keith Pitt is, is Minister for Resources. So when you talk about lithium and why are we not doing more, this is a person that cannot even say the word batteries, right? Um, so he is not committed to developing that industry. Um, in fact, I've talked to people from uh, rare earth mineral mines in like Cooper PD, um, and uh, so not Cooper PD, um, I can't think of the areas now, but Western Australia, and they have chronic staff shortages, expertise shortages. They desperately need more engineers. But those engineers are stuck in the Hunter Valley in mines that are on reduced operation and are not being released. So the irony of the, you know, the, the, the contradiction of the talk for jobs and economic opportunity, but the unwillingness to recognise where the new opportunities are in industries um, I think is very tied to vested interests that carries too much influence with the main with the government and the major parties um, so and and also putting into perspective the um, fossil fuel dependent workplace or workforce it is not as big as what is said it is much smaller and in fact the industries and employers in other areas that are at risk are far far greater for the overall um, economy and employment rates. So the next question we have for you, Zali, is from Peter. What advice do you have for the new independents focusing on climate policy? Um, well, look, I think you need to, um, obviously, if they're running on a platform of climate, I think to, you know, it's really important. We need more people focused on sensible policy. Um, for me, it's really important that uh, I do believe in smart policies in the sense that I do, it's really important that they be achievable and to have a clear plan of how they can be achievable. So for me, that's a key part of the plan behind the climate bill, uh, but also that it's something that was able to bring everyone to the table on a debate that has been so incredibly divisive and has been weaponized in Australia. This 
This has been used for political gain, not for community or overall long-term gain of Australians. Um, so I think that is really important to focus on the positives, uh, to bring your community with you. So not everyone in the community moves at the same pace, accepts the change. And so I, I do always say it's important to seek to understand before being understood. So trying to understand why people are reluctant or fearful of that transition to to clean technology and to reducing emissions? What do they fear they're going to lose? Because it's, sometimes it's very um, factually incorrect and they've based a lot of assumptions on wrong information. I think we've moved a long way for getting people more informed, but there's still work to be done. So I think that is a really important thing. I think all independents or all community um, candidates wanting to run on campaign to hold forums like this, hold forums for the public, bring experts. There are so many experts just so keen to share their knowledge about like people like Leslie, I know Tim Buckley's on the call, people who are prepared to share their expertise. They have been in this space for a long time. Um, and the benefit of being independent is Academics are often very happy to share their and, and brief and share their knowledge because they're not taking a partisan side. They're genuinely trying to bring forward their knowledge. So I think hosting climate forums to talk about, you know, the status quo, where are we at, the Bureau of Meteorology, you know, the latest IPCC report, where our opportunities are and, and start myth busting around some of the misconceptions about you know, what costs and those kind of issues. I mean, the beauty is this election, I think there isn't the same scope for the misleading information that we had in 2019. Wonderful. Michelle, I'm actually thinking, should we give Dali a chance to catch, catch her breath? We can run back to a couple of questions for Leslie. And, uh, and then, or are we running out of time? We're probably a little bit over time already. Sorry. <laughs> we have plenty of more questions and beautiful comments from all sorts of people. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm fine to go on, I don't know, about Leslie and Nicolette and, and Sally. It's, it's up to you. How do we pick between these questions? So there's a, a fabulous from Roz, which is asking, you know, when we finally get to net zero, how long before we get back to normal? I thought that was a great question from Roz to Leslie. And there's another one there on coking coal. Did you see that? Is, that, is that a sense of back to normal in terms of the climate has stabilised? Because the reality is at some point we're going to need to go into negatives because we, we are going to need to absorb and, you know, there it's going to be. So unfortunately, the trajectory we're on is even with an incredibly fast acceleration of emission reduction by 2030, a lot of, a lot of warming is baked in. Um, I'm sure the ex scientist, scientists in the room can say um, we are on track for a certain amount. Of, our prospect of staying close to 1.5 are slim. Um, and at the moment, we're very much on track to two degrees. And that, you know, we are going to reach some tipping points that may be hard to undo. But that should not demotivate anyone or, you know, this is, Every minute gain is worth is worth fighting for and worth trying to do. So even though it can sometimes feel like um, discouraging that bigger gains aren't being made, I'm a big believer in incremental progress um, and that um, you yeah, absolutely um, gradually we, we can get there. There is unfortunately going to be, um, you know, there will be some need to get to negative emissions and, you know, I think we will hopefully develop technologies and, um, you know, accept, you know, normal um, things will change, like record levels of, sol of rooftop solar being installed, batteries, no longer building connected to gas, like right? new developments would not automatically have gas connections, um, better insulation, better designs. The fact that pretty much all vehicles post 2030 you know there will be very little new vehicles available that are not evs um, these things are going to happen the, the biggest challenge for us is to accelerate that change yep so, a, a slightly different dimension zali with a view to labor's promise to adopt the uluru statement of the heart 
How are First Nations people being invited to provide input and participation in Australia's goals for Net Zero 2050 and your own policies? Uh, yeah, look, I very specifically included traditional owners in the creation of the Climate Change Commission um, to ensure that they were part of the consultation process, but also um, the makeup of the Climate Change Commission. I think just as in the guiding principles of in the bill, really important to recognise that you have voices from industry and ec economy, but also from regional development and, and, um, uh, uh, and then diversity when it comes to um, uh, Indi and well, Indigenous Australians being recognised and participating, really important for that to happen. One of the key things recognised is for the change to occur well, um, communities have to come on board. Communities have to participate in the process. They have to be engaged. Um, and that is very much recognised in the bill and part of the, the drafting. Sally, there's some great questions here from Joe, Joe, Joe Taranto, I believe. Uh, there are so many people who will only hear a sound bite. What should ours be? Um, <laughs> uh, look, I'll be, I'll be releasing my own policy shortly. And for me, I've broken it down to, um, you know, having a five-step plan to net zero. Um, step one is legislating, so that's it. Um, uh, so I think it is really important to break it down, having a, a more information if needed, but having it um, uh, broken down. But also, look, I'm a big believer in focus on the positives of what um, the benefits will be, so being very clear about that. Um, I think it's breaking down that perception that it's going to cost too much or that it's there's a... Um, to, to achieve emissions reductions, we're going to have to give something up and then people, then you have to convince people of what they have to give up. I think it's more about we have an opportunity before us um, and, uh, and the question is, are we, you know, are we going to take up that opportunity or are we going to let others benefit from it? Um, uh, it's not a zero-sum game. Um, there is not a choice of if we don't do this, things remain the same. We know they will not remain the same. If the bushfires of the 2019 summer, you know, uh, should be vivid in everyone's mind that there is no new normal. Um, and so there is only adaptation and mitigation really as an option. Can I have a go at the soundbite as well? Um, mine is that only a community independent working with other independents in the crossbench can break the climate policy roadblock created by the major parties and all of Zali's work getting her private members bill ready is absolutely like number one business for the new 47th parliament. Nicolette, I hadn't seen you there. <laughs> absolutely absolutely that one it's great to see you there um you know this i think i've given all independence lots of learnings this week <laughs> um uh it's uh it's it's uh there's you know there's a lot to to do but the beauty i i do think that that yes um there is a lot of legislation ready to go um, for post so it's not a situation where major parties can go away and say okay well look I'll consider this let me go away and think about it and I'll come back to you in three years about what I might do about it um, whether it's climate whether it's the Federal Integrity Commission whether it is you know legislating better standards in the house political advertising um, there is a lot of legislation that has had a lot of thorough work done during this parliament and introduced and so they are all they are all there absolutely ready willing and able obviously there can be consultation obviously you know there is debate but um, there is a yeah I think there is a momentum from this parliament that I dearly hope Nicolette and all the independents and community groups that that momentum can carry through to post this election. Yeah. We dearly hope that we could have a candidate in Benelong. We, we haven't yet been able to um, resolve that and announce, but uh, we do have a question from Joe. And so let's, let's take the hypothetical question. What questions would you suggest we ask of a candidate for Benelong 
once they are finally announced. Uh, yeah, look, you've got a retiring member, so that's quite interesting in that everyone really comes with a technically clean slate, I guess. Um, but the question is, as a new member, what prospects do you generally, how can you convince us of your genuine prospects that you will um, uh, cross the floor to represent your community views? Because when we look at the record of our previous member, if you're looking for from a coalition point of view, um, despite lots of promises and talk, ultimately the voting record does not reflect the, the rhetoric. Um, new members, um, obviously it is about looking at, um, you know, what is your position going to be? Do you pledge to do these things? Because at the end of the day, they will be broken promises. Whether you are a front bencher or a backbencher, you make your promise to your electorate on the issues. Um, and I think more MPs need to be held to account for that. Um, we've been working hard at trying to pull back the curtain on how processes work in Parliament. Voting records are all there and available um, and asking questions. So, on, you know, after a sitting week uh, of an MP, well, what did you vote on? Why did you vote like this? What was your consideration on this legislation? So one of the things that happens here is the first thing you do when you come in as a member in the corridors is um, you go past a wall of um, pages. And I, initially I said, well, what are they for? And what happens is the major parties, all MPs have a pager, um, and that pager tells them where to go, what to do, and where to vote at all times. Um, they have very little engagement on legislation or decisions. Um, so Labor will do a caucus vote, the coalition will do their party room. Um, but I have had numerous conversations with backbenchers, especially um, on the coalition side, because ultimately government dictates the agenda of the day about issues and I have had backbenchers ask me what is the government's position on this and then I might raise it in the party room and I find that outrageous to think that they their vote gives government majority and enables these legislations to pass but they are not consulted they are not briefed they do not have a full understanding of what they vote for. They certainly don't understand amendments and a lot of things that happens. And so to me, that is a, an, a derogation of your duty to your electorate in terms of your vote. It is, you're essentially handing a vote by proxy to, you know, the, 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 the cabinet or the very inner sanctum of a party if your MP cannot be scrutinised on how, why and what did they vote for when they're in Parliament. So these are the questions I would ask to a prospective MP, especially someone from a party. What do you understand your freedom to vote by your conscience or in accordance with your community wishes to be? How do you understand that, you know, that you will be able to affect that? Because I've had conversations with first-term MPs who have said, look, look, I really care about this issue, but I just have to get pre-selected first and be here longer than one term before I can really stand up for it. And it's like, if you can't stand up for it now, you are never going to stand up for it uh, because you will always face the challenge of pre-selection if you don't do, you know, if you stand up for values. So, and the, the irony would be the record shows it is those MPs that do cross the floor that do stand up for their values, someone like Bridget Archer in the recent, this parliament, are actually then in a more powerful position because they cannot be taken for granted. Um, and so, you know, I think those questions need to be asked of, um, of anyone, any candidate asking for your vote. Yep. Excellent. I think we really may be out of time. Um, oh, I've just seen the time. Yes, probably. For me, it is. It's a pretty good day. <laughs> Dali, I understand it's been a pretty challenging week so thank you so much for, for my pleasure but best of luck and thank you for being so engaged and um uh and I think supporting the independent movement the ultimately I always say I am just one of the many voices of Warringah um my vote does not take precedence over the vote of Canberra um and really it is it is communities that make this happen. It is not, it's not, organ, it's not other organisations. It's, you know, it is all down to communities. I, I, I feel very um, 
it is the, the power of the, you know, my, my team in Warringah that makes it all absolutely worthwhile. So thank you for having me. <laughs> Do you? Okay, so thank you to Zali, Leslie and Nicolette. Thank you so much. Did you want to say anything to finish? Pressure? <laughs> no. You don't have to <laughs> pressure. Just checking. <laughs> I'd just like to wish both Zali and Nicolette the absolute best of luck um, and huge support from everybody on this call for the upcoming fight and we'll be watching with enormous interest, but... All power to you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Leslie. Um, so we're finishing up for today. Um, we, it's been fantastic. I've learned, I've written lots of notes as we've gone. Um, and thank you so much again for coming and talking to us. In the lead up to the federal election, Voice has been along, we're going to run a series of events and we're going to touch on the issues that have been identified during our um, listening project from the community of Benelong, um, including income inequality, funding cuts to the NDIS, reduced housing affordability, um, and also cuts to the higher education sector. Um, you can find out all about our upcoming events as um, through our social media, different comms channels. Please um, subscribe or join the chats where, uh, where you need to. Also, if you do want to get more active, we are obviously loving the um, support to support Nicolette and Bradfield, our friends and neighbours. So if anybody wants to jump on the campaign and help out, please do. I think uh, we're going to throw some of the um, links in the chat as well, because as Zali said, only three more independents needed to get the Climate Act bill through Parliament. So I think we can all lend a support across to Bradfield as well, even though we're in Benelong, we're as neighbours. Um, as you know, there is, um, sorry, more information always coming out all the time on what we're doing. We would love to also hear from you through our kitchen table conversations, which we're holding dates are on our website at all times um, as we move closer to the election. So thank you to Michelle and Robin also for hosting the night and Thank you to everybody for coming along. We hope you'll come along to our next session um, in hopefully the not too distant future. Thanks. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Voices of Ben Along. Thanks, Nicolette. <laughs> Bye. Thanks.